support as possible. The British Business Bank, for example, has led many schemes and initiatives in order to promote inclusivity in the Pacific that he thinks there is a gap uh, uh, in the market about, um, about such an initiative. General Minister, yes, me. A gap that won't close until 2058 at the current rate. Women who want to go into business can't wait for the Conservatives to get their act together. They need a new deal for working people, a review of the gender pay gap, menopause action plans in the workplace. That's Labour's pro-business, pro-women plan to smash the glass ceilings and break down the barriers to have a plan. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm afraid the shadow front bench spokesman is confusing all sorts of different things. FTSE directors are not the ones who need support getting quite frankly the fact that gender equality in the workplace. Dick Fletcher. Children, and we continue to work closely across government. Yeah, thank the Minister for her answer, but does she believe that there should be a Minister for Men as there is a Minister for Women? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank my honourable friend, APG? He knows with my health hat on the work we're doing to improve lung cancer outcomes for men and in the suicide prevention strategy that will be coming forward. We know that middle aged men are at a particular risk. Can I reassure him, though, that the Equalities Hub has responsibility for both men and, and women uh, to ensure equality for all? Speak to the Secretary of State so that we can be clearer about that, how that work uh, impacts on men. Margaret Furrier. Mr. Speaker, requires all public facilities to have sanitary bins. Hygiene bins need to be provided in men's toilets. What steps is the Minister taking to introduce legislation that addresses this issue? Yeah. Well, can I just reassure uh, the Honourable Lady that there is work going on in this space? Uh, my uh, ministerial colleague from DWP is looking at this and will be updating the House shortly. Hannah Barbell. Number six, please, Mr. Speaker. Sure, uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions six and nine together. The government has taken numerous steps to tackle both gender and racial landmark inclusive Britain strategy, as well as various initiatives to support women in the workplace. As outlined in our Inclusive uh, Britain report, we are working towards a new voluntary inclusion confidence scheme to support employers on clear, manageable uh, advice on effective diversity and, in and inclusion interventions. And about that. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Like most things in this place, this government's policy on parental leave is in the dark ages. Research by Pregnant and Scrooge shows better paid parental leave for all parents would bring greater equality in the labour market, yet this government seems dogged in its determination to stand still. So why is this government blocking greater gender equality in the workplace? Thursday. Uh, Mr Speaker, I completely disagree uh, with the Honourable Lady. This Government has done more than any other in order to promote uh, gender equality in the workplace, including bringing in policies such as shared parental leave. We have also done, uh, uh, brought in things like extended redundancy protection for those on maternity leave and introduced carers leave, and we are supporting legislation to strengthen the protections against harassment in the workplace. Mr Speaker, a new report from the Fawcett Society shows how the motherhood pay penalty when mothers with two children take home 26% less income than women without children impacts a woman's income and earning power throughout her working life and compounds the effects of the ethnicity pay gap. So will the UK government tackle this by making flexible working the default and in introducing mandatory gender and ethnicity pay gap reporting? Here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, just finished a private members' bill which is making the right to ask for flexible working uh, mandatory. That is what I think is the right balance that strikes for business, rather than making it mandatory for people to demand flexible working. Not every business can provide this, and that is not something that is going to improve equality in the workplace. When I asked uh, black and minority ethnic residents in Basingstoke about their experience at work, their responses were concerning. And I've been working especially with our local employers, our big local employers, the local education authority and the NHS to tackle the issues. What is my right honourable friend doing to ensure that public services are exemplars when it comes to race equality in the workplace? Um, I thank my, uh, my right honourable friend for her question. Uh, if she sees the work that we put into our Inclusive Britain strategy, she will see that almost everything that is an action is about the public sector. There is so much that we can do in order to promote racial equality in the workplace, but we need to do this in a way that is fair and transparent as well as universal. The Equality Act protects characteristics and not groups, and if she would like to work with me on any specific initiative, I'd be very keen to hear uh, more about what she's been working on. 
come to SNP spokesperson Kirsten Oswald. Mr. Speaker, there are growing concerns over new technologies such as artificial intelligence and automation software being used in recruitment and employment, with studies showing that AI perpetuates bias across gender, race, age, disability, and dialect and regional differences of speech as well. So, what recent assessment has the Minister made of the equalities impact of AI use in recruitment and in the workplace, and has she raised this with Cabinet colleagues? Uh, yeah, yes, I have raised it with Cabinet colleagues. In fact, I had the meeting with the government, Chief Government uh, Science Officer just last week on this issue. It is a concern that AI can embed uh, bias, and that means that we need to look at the data sets and the large language models that are informing the AI that is being used. The equality impact assessments, of course, apply for the public sector equality duty. Much of AI is being done in the private sector. We will do our part, but if there is any specific, uh, as I say, I'm very keen to hear from members about specific initiatives which they think can, can help. We now come to Topital Day, Marie Miller. For one, Mr Speaker. Yeah. First day. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In February this year, we announced the STEM recharge pilot to support parents and carers back into STEM roles. Since then, we have recruited and trained the first cohort of technology and engineering returners in the Midlands and the north of England. They have received personalised training and support to help get them back into the workforce, and we are now recruiting a second cohort. We will use insights and lessons learned from the pilot to develop new guidance so that STEM employers across the UK can benefit from the full wealth of the returner STEM pool. Demery Miller. The approaching summer holidays see a spike in domestic abuse. Does my right honourable friend agree that it's important people know there's help available? And will she lend her support to the campaign that I'm running in Basingstoke with Police and Crime Commissioner Donna Jones to help make sure victims of domestic abuse in North Hampshire know they're not alone and there's help there? Uh, I do agree with my uh, right honourable friend, Mr Speaker. It is important that people know where to go for help when they have experienced domestic abuse. The government is providing police and crime commissioners with dedicated ring-fenced funding for at least 900 independent sexual violence and domestic abuse advisors and will fund an additional 100, bringing the total to over 1,000 by 2025. Martin Day. Mr. Speaker, the cost of living crisis disproportionately affects disabled constituents, reliant on specialist diets and equipment, but now faced with increased food and energy costs. So, can the Minister confirm what a cross governmental action this government can take to better support disabled constituents with these additional costs? Minister. The government recognises the, the challenges for. Uh, disabled people and those with health conditions and the disability cost of payment living payment the 150 pounds should be seen as one part of the overall package and benefitscalculator.gov.uk will help people to claim the wider benefits that are out there that's just one of the payments Lynn Saxby. <laughs> The Institute of Physics and their campaign to increase diversity in physics, which is the second most popular A-level for boys, but only 16th for girls. What steps is my right honourable friend taking to encourage more girls to study physics beyond GCSE? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Studying STEM A-levels such as physics can boost potential earnings, and with a growing demand for students with STEM qualifications in the jobs market, it is important that girls take the opportunity that this provides. We are therefore working with the Department for Education in funding an Inclusion in Schools project, which is designed to increase the uptake of A-level physics from students in underrepresented groups, including girls. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Homelessness is on the rise and this disproportionately impacts young LGBT plus people. The Youth LGBT plus Homelessness Charity AKT has reported a 58% increase in new referrals over the last four years. So will the Minister work with Cabinet colleagues to better understand the specific challenges of people in this community facing homelessness and look at what more can be done to support them? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady raises a very, very important point, and I'm pleased to say and report to her that I have met with uh, colleagues in DLUC and we have held a, a roundtable to discuss exactly those issues. I think one of the key elements that we really need to do is gather the data so that we can better understand some of the causes and what the solutions might be to help uh, people as she... Uh, how many... How many discussions has the Secretary of State had with Department of Education colleagues about forthcoming guidance on trans-identifying children? 
Mr Speaker, I've been working closely with the Education Secretary because it's important we get this guidance for schools right. It must show schools how to be compassionate to pupils questioning their gender in a way that is compliant with the Equality Act, including ensuring single-sex spaces are maintained and that the safety and well-being of all pupils is not compromised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Conversion therapy should be banned entirely, yeah. not with a voluntary loophole as this government are intending. We know voluntary means of conversion therapy would be open to coercion. This is a loophole so large it would leave any bill meaningless. Will she commit to a full ban in conversion therapy, as supported by organisations such as Stonewall and the Thai campaign in Scotland? Yeah. 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 Um, the Honourable Lady the Lady raises Lady. very important points, and these are exactly why we have taken considerable care to engage with a whole range of stakeholders to consider all of the issues that need addressing. And it is precisely these points as to why we are going for pre-legislative scrutiny, so that all of them can, uh, all of those issues can be looked at again, and make sure that we present the very best bill to help people uh, who are uh, subject to these horrible crimes. Well, that means it. Speaker, gamble aware figures showed that the number of women seeking help for problem gambling doubled between 2015 and 2020, with up to a million women deemed at risk. Data also shows that women are less likely to participate in sports betting, instead, more active on online bingo and casino style games. What work is my right honourable friend taking with Cabinet colleagues to highlight the risk of online gambling, reduce the stigma, and help women to seek treatment? <laughs> My, honor my honourable friend raises a really important point, and that is why we have uh, recently published the Gambling White Paper, in that we address a number of the issues my honourable friend raises. Stigma is a very important one. We want people to come forward and get the treatment that they need, and we're also introducing a statutory levy on gambling operators to ensure that we have the research, the prevention and treatment that is needed to help those suffering with gambling harm. Sir, agree. Earlier this year, the government cut almost £6 million worth of funding to a Save the Children programme providing education and other services to girls in Afghanistan, despite a promise to put women and girls at the heart of the SCDO's work. Will the Secretary of State work with colleagues at the FCDO to deliver on the government's commitment and reinstate this funding? Yeah. Uh, th I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. Educating girls is one of the top priorities under the British Government's international development strategy. Indeed, Mr Speaker, it is the way you change the world. And I can tell her that over the, five years, the last five years for which figures are available, the British taxpayer procured a decent education for more than 8 million children in the poor world. <laughs> that completes questions. We come to questions to the Deputy Prime Minister. I call Stephen Bonner on a closed question. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I have been asked to reply. Global oil prices have remained largely stable this year. This has not changed following the announcement of additional production cuts by Saudi Arabia and Russia. We expect the impact of the cuts will be mitigated by the increase in supply from other producers and a decrease in global oil demand, as we have seen previously. Yeah. Yeah. Bonner. Speaker, if we want to insulate ourselves from future price rises, then we need to invest in a greener future. The United, the United States gets it. They've committed £370 billion on net zero energies. The EU, they get it. They're set to match that figure. And in Scotland, we get it. We have the ambition to lead the world on renewable energy. We have the energy, but we do not have the power. So why is Westminster trying to block Scotland's path to a safer, greener future? Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, we of course will continue to invest in renewables, but I would say to the party opposite, we should also invest in our energy independence, yeah. and that means investing in the North Sea. If we fail to invest in the North Sea, we will be more reliant on foreign producers and we will have higher carbon emissions as we import from elsewhere. Craig yeah. McKinley. Uh, question two, Mr Speaker. Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is in Vilnius 
attending the NATO summit. This summit is an opportunity to build on the work we have done over the past year, strengthening NATO and supporting Ukraine. Mr Speaker, in addition to my meetings in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. McKinley. Speaker, New Labour's old mantra used to be education, education, education. Its new one seems to be tax education, tax education, tax education. Does the Deputy Prime Minister share my disgust at Labour's plans to tax education and choice, which could lead to 40,000 pupils being sent into the state sector with the cost to the taxpayer. I have a number of English language schools in my constituency, and they are concerned that this will apply to them as well, uh, as well as tuition, out-of-hours tuition, and sports uh, training uh, additionally. Uh, Does the Deputy Prime Minister object to these measures as strongly as I do? Yes, well, once again, we have seen from the Labour Party them putting the politics of envy above the interests of children in this country. And as my honourable friend rightly highlights, recent analysis shows this could lead to over 40,000 pupils leaving the schools they are in, placing further burdens on existing schools and costing £300 million. We now come to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Angela Rayner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I know you're a keen historian, so I looked up the last time a Prime Minister missed two sessions in a row <laughs> with other engagements, which was March 1996. And I'm very <laughs> proud to be filling the boots of Lord John Prescott, but I think it's safe to say he's no hessel time, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Why is it? John Prescott asked that in Tory Britain, tens of thousands of families are facing repossession, negative equity and homelessness. And can he tell us, 27 years later, why I'm having to ask the same question? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, clearly the right hon. Lady did not listen to my previous comments. The Prime Minister is at NATO. Of course, that wouldn't be a problem if she'd had her way. Her old boss wanted to abandon Ukraine, abolish the army and withdraw from NATO, and he certainly wouldn't be going to any summit, Mr Speaker. And, it, and, when, it, and when, it comes, when it comes to house building, I will take no lectures from the party opposite on home ownership. My parents would not have been able to buy their own home if it were not for Margaret Thatcher and the reforms introduced by her government, and this government is building on those with record house building. Mr Speaker, I think he's taking lessons from the former Prime Minister on telling the facts. The last last Labour government worked hard to dramatically reduce the number of children in temporary accommodation. But under the Tories, the number of homeless children has risen by 75%. I'm proud of our record on tackling child poverty. Does the right honourable gentleman feel ashamed of his? Deputy Prime Minister. I'll tell you what this government has done. We have lifted 400,000 children out of child poverty. We have introduced the national living wage, something the party opposite totally failed to do, and increased increased the national living wage by the largest amount ever, meaning £1,800 for working people and cutting their taxes by doubling the personal allowance. That is the surest way to ensure we lift people out of poverty and would never have happened with the party opposite. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, it's like the ghost of Prime Minister Past is still here. And I tell the right honourable gentleman that he should be careful about the stats he used because the Children's Commissioner warned the other Prime Minister about peddling false narrative on child poverty around those figures. The truth is, rising bills and soaring mortgages and plummeting real wages are pushing more and more families to the brink. Those already struggling are being hit hardest by the Tory mortgage bombshell and rising food costs. 
So can he tell us how many primary school children have been pushed into poverty since his government took power? Deputy Prime Minister. I would say to the Right Honourable Lady, it is this party, not the party opposite, which extended free school meals to all five, six and seven-year-olds, something the party opposite failed to do, and it sits alongside many measures we are taking to help people with the cost of living. We are paying half of families' energy bills last winter, winter funded by our 75 per cent windfall tax, freezing fuel duty helping families with childcare and delivering on our pledge to reduce the debt. It it may come as a surprise to the Right Honourable Lady, but balancing the books means more than working out how many more millions to take from her union paymasters. Mr Speaker, once again, he talks about balancing the books. His party crashed the economy. And he seems to be... He seems to be completely oblivious to what it's like for working people in this country at the moment. New research out today shows that 400,000 more primary school aged children are growing up in poverty since his government came to office. Why does he think that is? Deputy Prime Minister. I will take absolutely no lectures whatsoever from the party opposite about how we help children in the most need. It is record investment from this government in education, £2 billion more this year, £2 billion next year, which is giving those very children the best possible start in life, ensuring that we have the highest reading standards in the Western world. And I have to say to the, I have to say to the Honourable Lady, listen, her, her leader says he hates tree huggers. They seem very keen on hugging that ma- magic money tree. Mr Speaker, he doesn't even acknowledge it let alone explain why child poverty is rising. What hope has he got of solving it? So let me try a simpler question for him. How many kids don't have a permanent address today compared to when Labour left office in 2010? Deputy Prime Minister. We can exchange all these numbers across the dispatch box. These... Mr Speaker... Mr Speaker... These are the numbers that matter. There are 1.7 million fewer people in absolute poverty under this government. 400,000 fewer children, 200,000 fewer pensioners and 1 million fewer people of working age because the single best route out of poverty is a job and record numbers of people. Four million more people under this government have got a job. That is the difference between this party and the party opposite, who always leave office with unemployment higher. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, what matters is what people feel every single day at the moment, who are going to work and can't afford their mortgage, can't afford their rent and can't afford their bills because of this Conservative government. There are 55,000 more children without a permanent address today compared to when they took office 13 years ago. We've gone from a Labour cabinet focused on tackling child poverty to Tory ministers who won't even admit the problem. Just like the question time in March 1996, they can only offer excuses and not answers. Lord John Prescott said to Lord Michael Hesitine that day, How can the right honourable gentleman be so complacent in the face of sheer misery created by his government's policies? 27 years on, why are we asking the exact same thing? There will be more if we carry on. Come on, Deputy Prime. Mr Speaker. I know there's a reshuffle coming up on the other side, but this audition for, for John Prescott's old job is just getting a little bit hackneyed. It is this government that has lifted 400,000 children out of poverty. 
the party opposite. I hear the right lady claiming to be the party of working people, but under their policies, people can't even get to work. They support just stop oil protesters blocking our roads. They support their union paymasters stopping our trains. And of course, they support the hated ULEs stopping cars across our capital. While Conservatives get Britain moving, Labour are standing in everyone's way. Given the Mansion House Compact does not encourage our pension funds to invest specifically in British companies, what more can the government do to encourage greater investment in our companies, especially the climate technology startups, which are increasingly going abroad to find the funding they require to the benefit of our competitors? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I think my honourable friend raises a very important point about both start-up capital and ensuring that we get more money to, to high-growth companies. I would say that the Chancellor's Pension Compact is a very important step forward and will unlock £75 billion of additional investment. I'm quite confident large amounts of that will go to UK companies, and that sits alongside measures such as the Edinburgh reforms to financial services, again, which will help improve financial services in this country and unlock money for those industries. Yeah. SNP Deputy Leader Murray Black. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last month, the Deputy Prime Minister dismissed warnings from these benches that mortgage rates were nearly back to where they were after the disastrous mini-budget. This week, mortgage rates have surpassed those levels. How high do they need to go until he and his government takes it seriously? Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady knows, people around the world know, that the driver of higher mortgage rates is higher inflation. And higher inflation is caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the post-COVID supply chains. But what we have to do is make sure we halve inflation. It's only by getting inflation under control that we will be able to get mortgage rates down, and that requires discipline. Discipline on spending, discipline on public sector pay, and discipline on energy supply, all of which is lacking from that party. Murray Black. Bank of England predict that mortgage payments will rise by at least £500 for a million households. The Prime Minister says that people need to hold their nerve. The Chancellor said just last night that mortgage holders should just shop around. Speaking of his own party, the member for South West Devon said, if the circus doesn't stop by Christmas, it's over. Does the Deputy Prime Minister understand that people can't afford to wait until Christmas and that they need help right now? Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the fundamental thing we have to do is to halve inflation. That is an approach that the IMF quote strongly endorses because higher inflation drives higher mortgage rates. But that's not all we are doing. With the mortgage charter signed up by 90% of mortgage providers, we are giving people help to extend their terms, to go interest uh, only, and to reduce their monthly payments. Now, that action is supported by Martin Lewis, a real money-saving expert, unlike the big spenders on those benches. Stevenson. Last year, I visited Abbeyfield House in Wentzfield, and I was impressed by this model of assisted living for older people that gave them the independence of a self-contained flat, but the ability to eat and socialise together. I was deeply concerned to hear that a consultation is underway to close the Abbeyfield House in Wentzfield, um, and I went back to speak to older people. They unanimously want to stay there. Abbeyfield is a charity. His Majesty the King has been patron for 40 years now. It cannot meet the cost of updating the estate to meet environmental standards. Will my right honourable friends meet with me to see what support government can offer to Abbeyfield so that my residents don't have to leave the homes they love? Well, Mr Speaker, of course, I'm very happy to give my honourable friend that 
assurance, I, I would note that we have provided £7.5 billion of additional funding for social care and discharge, and specifically on energy. And we have got an energy advice service to support smaller businesses, and we will be piloting new audit and grant schemes, which may also help. Ed Davey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In January, Emily booked an appointment with her local dentist in Chard, Somerset, for the 14th of June only to be told by a neighbour at the end of May that the surgery had closed in April. Emily no longer has a dentist. All the remaining surgeries aren't taking on any new patients. Emily doesn't know what to do. So can the Deputy Prime Minister tell Emily and millions of people like her when can they get an appointment with a local NHS dentist? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, the, the right honourable gentleman may have missed, but our NHS workforce plan is investing an extra £2.4 billion into training and retaining crucial NHS staff, including dentists and GPs. And actually, the number of dentists will rise by 40%. And I would say to people across that constituency that the best way they can ensure better services for their NHS is to vote for Faye Perbrook. The Conservative candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, could the Deputy Prime Minister let us know when we can expect allocations from the Leveling Up Fund Round 3? And when it comes, will it be true to the Prime Minister's pledge that all parts of the country uh, will benefit, uh, including the South East and most particularly the very deserving town of Andover? <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister. Well, as well as being an excellent minister, I know how committed my right honourable friend is to the town of Andover. We will shortly be announcing the new approach to the third round, and further details of this approach will, be, will follow shortly. Pete Wishaw. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, there are some things you encounter in political life that is certain to horrify, appall or sicken you, but I do not think I have ever seen anything quite so grotesque as the painting over of Mickey Mouse on a children's mural, as was done by the Home Office in a detention centre in Kent. Now, no minister so far has roused the necessary compassion or concern to speak out about this. So can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister to look into the deeper recesses of his soul and just simply condemn it? Deputy Prime Minister. I'll tell the honourable gentleman what real compassion looks like, and that means stopping the vile people smuggling trade across the Channel, condemning women and children to death. This government is taking action to deal with it with our Stop the Boats bill, and that party shamefully, 18 times last night, voted against it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, on these benches, we know, as the party of aspiration, the importance of home ownership. Yeah, yeah. According to a recent estimate by Barclays Bank, it now takes an average of eight years for the f average first-time buyer to save for a deposit, and in parts of London and the South East, it can be longer than that. What is the Deputy Prime Minister and the Government doing in order to improve the prospects for younger people who want to own their own homes? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Well, uh, I know what a passionate champion of this issue my honourable friend is. It is actually the case that almost 850,000 households have been helped purchase a home since 2010. And actually, in 2021, the number of people getting onto the property ladder for the first time was at a 20-year high, thanks to initiatives such as First Homes and the Help to Buy scheme. Uh, of course, that stands in contrast to the party opposite, who oversaw the lowest level of house building since the 1920s. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With uh, rising ticket prices, many of my constituents find they can get the best value fare by going to the staff ticket office at Lancaster Station. It's perhaps why so many of them have signed my petition to save staffing at Lancaster Station. So, can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister, is the closure of ticket offices just yet another cost of living bombshell hitting my hard working constituents? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, it, it is important that the railways continue to reform after the record amount of money that we gave them during COVID. I would gently say to the 
Honourable Lady, that if she's concerned about her constituents getting anywhere on the railways, she should condemn the totally unjustified strikes which close them down week after week. Give forward. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Four summers ago, the unprecedented climate change-driven heat wave caused irreparable damage to Chelmsford's flyover. And since then, people from all across Essex have been stuck in Chelmsford, traffic jams, wasting time, hitting our economic growth. We badly need a new junction at the Army and Navy, but the funding decision has been stuck in Whitehall. So will my right honourable friend use his powerful cross-cabinet convening powers <coughs> to get Treasury and Transport to agree to the money so we can deliver a new junction, stop the traffic jams and get Chelmsford moving again. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I, I know how powerfully my right and my friend makes the case for this scheme, and she has done so once again in the Chamber. The Chancellor was sitting next to me and would also have heard the case. Uh, I, I understand that the outline case, business case submitted by Essex uh, County Council is being considered by ministers right now, and all relevant ministers will have heard her injunction. Uh, Scottish Ambulance Service statistics showed an increase in hypothermic callouts of over 30 per cent across Scotland last winter and a staggering 84 per cent in the north in December. Whilst fuel calls have fallen slightly, Food and other costs have risen exponentially. To end the perversity of energy-rich Scotland seeing one-third of Scots in fuel poverty and literally freezing, when will the government bring in a social tariff to ensure that the poor and vulnerable can get through this winter without calling out the ambulance service because they are freezing? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, as my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, set out in the autumn statement, we are exploring the best approach to consumer protection from April 2024 as part of wider retail market reforms. I would just reiterate to the honourable gentleman that this winter we paid half of energy bills in Scotland. That was thanks to the strength of our union. But, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I remind the Deputy Prime Minister and the House that yesterday was National Remembering Srebrenica Day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But may I particularly point out a little known fact that British soldiers took out about 2,000 civilians in April 1993 from Srebrenica. Those British soldiers were B Squadron, the 9th 12th Lancers, not widely known. But those 2,000 people from B Squadron were actually under my command, and they saved a huge number of lives by taking them out. And they too should be remembered for their very gallant actions, because it was very dangerous. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I, I pay tribute to my right honourable and gallant friend and to uh, all of those who he commanded in the 1990s. Uh, we must honour the memory of those killed and pay tribute to the extraordinary courage shown by their families, by survivors and all those members of our armed forces who served so gallantly in that situation. Williams. In the Welsh Affairs Committee, my hon. Friend for Ceredigion asked the Chief Secretary to the Treasury about the varying comparability factors uh, for Wales, for Crossrail, for Thameslink and for HS2. Yeah. His answer began with, you are dragging me into quite complex technical details. <laughs> and then he gave no complex technical details. <laughs> I'm sure that the people of Wales would be delighted to tackle any complex technical details were the Deputy Prime Minister to explain to the House why we are paying £5 billion for a white elephant in HS2 which by now comes nowhere near our country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. <laughs> well, it, it, is strength, it is thanks to the strength of our United Kingdom that, that record sums are going to Wales under the Barnet Consequentials. Indeed, in the spring budget, we increased devolved administration funding by £630 million. That included £180 million for the Welsh Government, so we are ensuring resources are going to Wales so they can enhance their transport infrastructure. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. If it was not so serious, it would be comical. However, in Horning on the Norfolk Broads, I have a whole area totally cut off from having a mobile signal 
wait for it, until August because of nesting seagulls taking up residency in the new telecoms mast. Okay, okay. Gulls are protected, the nest can't be moved, but let's say a family holidaying on the Norfolk Broads gets into distress this summer, they will not be able to make an emergency call, which could be life-threatening. Would the Deputy Prime Minister please help me call on Natural England to be sensible and make sure that, for public safety reasons, we can get a mobile phone mask working in a prime holiday location? Well, well we, we all love the, the diversity of, of wildlife in this country, and particularly on the North Norfolk coast that he represents, but I think he makes a very strong point about the balance between that and ensuring people have access to modern communication facilities, and I shall certainly take it up with Natural England. John Speller. Day in, day out, the public and businesses are hit by endless chaos and confusion across government departments. For them, clearly, Britain isn't working. Yeah. Now, if I can paraphrase the Deputy Prime Minister earlier, we know there's a reshuffle coming up on their side. So, can you tell us, is this down to obstruction and incompetence in the civil service, or is it rather that so many of their ministers are just not up to the job? Yeah. Well, I, I think you can see from the record of this government whether it's cutting NHS waiting lists, whether it is record funding for our schools and hospitals, we have an excellent team that will continue to serve. All homes! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, last week we all celebrated the 75th anniversary of the NHS. You may not be aware, but it's also the 75th anniversary of Newton Aycliffe, a new town in my constituency, designed by William Beveridge. Could I ask the Prime Minister, to, to, to ask his honourable friend, the, the Prime Minister, to come and visit me as his constituency neighbour and celebrate these 75 years and indeed the 60 years of the community newspaper provided by the Howarth family? Thank the Prime Minister. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't uh, speak to the Prime Minister's diary, although I will make representations. I would be delighted to visit his constituency if he wishes me to attend instead. I'm not going to play one night, Thank you, Mr Speaker. The day I had to phone my bank and tell them that I was having difficulty paying my mortgage was one that has lived with me for years. What I found was that because my income was so low at the time, ironically, I was not eligible to switch to interest only or get any help. I never want my constituents to feel the terror and abandonment that I felt that day. Can he understand that? Because his complete lack of empathy in his responses to the deputy leader of this group suggests not. I do welcome the temporary measures, but they are temporary. This is a mortgage crisis that has been two years in the making. Does the Prime Minister and himself really think they're going to fix it in 12 months? Prime Minister. <coughs> well, of course, it's deeply, deeply disturbing, upsetting and worrying for anyone to contemplate losing their home. That is exactly why my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has introduced the mortgage charter, now signed up by 90% of the mortgage market, which will provide support for people. In addition to that, I would say that uh, after three months, people on universal credit can also apply for further support. Jonathan Gullis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A government survey has shown that 75% of British businesses support improvements to the UK's sick pay system. And yesterday, my right honourable friend, the member of South Swindon, launched a report alongside WY Economics and the Centre for Progressive Change with ideas on how that could be done. So, will my honourable friend make sure that we get a meeting with the Chancellor to see what ideas can be put ahead of the autumn budget, which will also have an uh, income, economic boost of £4 billion to the UK economy? The Prime Minister. Well, well, my honourable friend as ever has made a very strong case. The Chancellor is sitting next to me, and I'm quite sure he would be delighted to meet with him. <laughs> Dan Carden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The forced isolation of people in care homes and hospitals from their loved ones since the beginning of the pandemic and its terrible consequences, as well as the many who died alone, has left a profound trauma. We've learned the hard way that the care of a loved one is not an optional extra, it's a central part of dignified care. 
My Care Supporters Bill would guarantee this fundamental right. And while the Government recognises there's a problem, its recently announced consultation relates to visiting and not a legal right to a care supporter at all times. So would the Deputy Prime Minister speak to the Prime Minister about bringing forward legislation in the next King's speech? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I, I think the uh, Honourable Gentleman is, is right to highlight the need for, for care supporters to be able to have that kind of access, and I will take away the points that he has raised and raise them with my ministerial colleagues. Karen Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. You know the value of our interparliamentary relations, and in particular the Interparliamentary Union, which was founded nearly 135 years ago in this place. And we are very honoured this week to be joined by the President of the Interparliamentary Union, Mr Duarte Pacheco. Would my right honourable friend join his campaign to get the USA to rejoin this very important international organisation? Question. Well, uh, as my right honourable friend knows, the United Kingdom was a, a founding member of the Interparliamentary uh, Union, and I would very much like the United States to, to rejoin. I am very happy to help make that case. We're a hobbits. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Not a day goes by without serious sexual harassment allegations in organisations up and down the country. My private member's bill on workplace protection from harassment could go a long way to address some of these serious issues, and indeed, the bill has full government support. However, it is currently stuck in the other place. But a compromise is now in sight to amend the bill so that it can pass through the House of Lords. Our rules require that any amendment made in the House of Lords needs to come back to the House of Commons. Will he ensure that a small amount of government time is made available in this place between now and the end of the parliamentary session to ensure that this important bill will become law? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, as the Honourable Lady knows, we, we have supported the bill. We are working on the bill, and my right honourable friend, the Equalities Minister, is very happy to, to meet with the Honourable Lady to, to discuss the measures further. That completes. Deputy Prime Minister, question. Just, just let the room clear a little. Uh, point of order, Don Butler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if you're shocked, but I am. The Deputy Prime Minister had an opportunity to correct the record today where he misled the.